This is the Annex, a sociology podcast. I'm Dan Morrison from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. My guest today is Ali Megji, Associate Professor in Sociology at the University of Cambridge. Megji investigates the global dynamics of racialization and racism using critical race theory and post-colonial sociology. A prolific author, he has published four books in the past five years, most recently 2003's A Secret Synergy, Race, Decoloniality, and World Crises with Temple University Press. In 2022, The Racialized Social System, Critical Race Theory as Social Theory with Polity. In 2020, Decolonizing Sociology also with Polity. And finally, in 2019, Black Middle Class Britannia, Identities, Repertoires, Cultural Consumption with Manchester University Press in the UK and Oxford University Press here in the United States. As these books suggest, Ali is an expert in the areas of decolonial thought, critical race theory, the sociology of knowledge, and social theory. He's here primarily to discuss a forthcoming article in Sociological Forum, Du Boisian Sociology After Du Bois, Frazier, St. Clair Drake, and the Global and Comparative Study of Race and Empire. This article is part of his larger project examining the unpublished writings of five essential Black sociologists, including Du Bois, Frazier, Anna Julia Cooper, St. Clair Drake, and Ida B. Wells Barnett. In addition to all this research, Megji is co-editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Sociology and Sociology Compass, alongside many other efforts to serve and advance post- and decolonial sociology. So alongside all of that, a person who must be extremely tired, today on the Annex Black Global Thought with and after Du Bois, stay with us. So Ali Megji, welcome to the Annex. Thanks so much for having me on, and thanks so much for the a wonderful introduction. Well, it is one of the more expansive ones I've done because <laughs> I was looking at your CV and your bio and your website and things. And I was like, man, when does this person sleep? Where does he get the energy? How can I borrow some <laughs> so that I can get through? It's it's dying slowly. Don't worry. It's, it's, it's dying. dying. <laughs> Yeah, well, we talk about, you know, work-life balance, but really work-life integration, right? And uh, how can we do those things yeah. successfully, both of them? Yeah, this is true. Also, I don't have any caring duties and things associated with that, which obviously makes it easier to have a work-life balance, let's say. Yes, well stated, well <laughs> stated. All right, well, let's get into it. Your article, Du Boisian Sociology After Du Bois, Frazier, St. Clair Drake, and the Global and Comparative Study of Race and Empire, argues that the Du Boisian sociological tradition extends well beyond Du Bois himself, and you focus on E. Franklin Frazier and St. Clair Drake. Would you unpack your argument a bit for us? How do many sociologists understand the work of Frazier and Drake, and what are the consequences of their miscategorization or mischaracterization? Sure, so that's a really interesting question, and I would say that there are a couple of things going on in this paper in terms of the context. Firstly, there's this kind of underlying philosophy of the paper which also, you know, relates to this wider project, which you mentioned earlier, to really excavate the Du Boisian tradition of sociology beyond the works of just Du Bois himself. It's really clear to see that there's been somewhat of a proliferation of research about Du Bois in the recent years. We have excellent books being written by, just to name a few people, Jose Itzigsen and Karina Brown, Alden Morris, and Earl Wright and Kalesha OJ. This significant corpus of scholarship clearly demonstrates that Du Bois was not just the founding figure of sociology, but more importantly, that he pioneered a specifically Du Boisian tradition of social science. While recognizing that Du Bois pioneered a Du Boisian tradition, however, very little work has actually been done on excavating this tradition beyond the works of Du Bois himself. This has created what I see as a slightly lopsided reality, where you have huge amounts of scholarship on, for example, the Weberian, the Marxist, or the Parsonian traditions of sociology, which covers dozens of authors, more than just Weber, Marx, and Parsons. But when it comes to the Du Boisian tradition, we still tend to only really discuss it through the works of Du Bois. So at the most kind of abstract or general level, the aim of this paper was really just to do some work of looking at the Du Boisian tradition beyond the works of Du Bois. And this is why I decided to look at two figures, Frazier and Drake, as you mentioned, both of whom I contend can be read as Du Boisian sociologists. And I've been doing archival work on these two thinkers, mostly at the Schomburg Center in New York and Howard University's archives as well, but also archives, you know, held at Chicago University and Harvard University. And as you alluded to in your question, I found that it's actually quite rare to view Fraser and Drake as being Du Boisians. And I think that their legacy in sociology has been relatively 
misrepresented or kind of only partially represented. Mm. Specifically, I found that both Fraser and Drake are often represented as being microethnographers of Black life in the American inner city, with both scholars often being read as acolytes of the Chicago school tradition of sociology. Fraser got his PhD in Chicago in 1932, Drake a couple of decades later in 1954. And if you look briefly at the secondary literature, you'll regularly get this reading of Fraser and Drake as being essentially Chicago school sociologists, just to clarify with some examples. In Franklin Edwards' obituary to Fraser, written in AJS in 1962, he comments that Fraser's sociological views were influenced by many of his teachers, notably Professor Frank Hankins at Clark and Robert Park at Chicago. Other scholars such as Thompson, Charles Jarman, Howard Becker, Saint Honoré, Loic Macant, they all view Drake and Fraser as essentially being byproducts of the Chicago School connected to scholars like Park, Lloyd Warner, and Charles Johnson. Indeed, St. Onod's famous book, African American Pioneers of Sociology, has a chapter on Drake, but dedicates it solely to his ethnographic Black metropolis, stating that in terms of theory, Drake would produce nothing equal to Black metropolis ever again in his career. So in this context, my paper argues that these overly exaggerated readings of Fraser and Drake overlook both what Fraser and Drake have actually said themselves about their own intellectual work and the corpus of scholarship produced by these two authors. And I argue that once we examine these dynamics, it's quite clear to see them fundamentally as Du Boisians rather than acolytes of the Chicago school. Just to kind of clarify with some examples about what Fraser and Drake said about Du Bois, Fraser even dedicated his 1949 the Negro in the United States to Du Bois, describing him as a pioneer of the social scientific study of the Negro. Two years later, he actually keynoted at a W.E.B. Du Bois testimonial dinner, describing him as one of our greatest leaders, praising Du Bois's foresight of declaring the problem of the 20th century being the problem of the color line. Fraser commented that Du Bois's sentiment had been clearly justified by world events, and that while other social scientists were fixating on national conditions of American racism, Du Bois provided a framework through which they were able to understand how the conditions of Black Americans were related to the conditions of exploited colonial subjects. Even prior to this testimonial, two years previous, Fraser had reviewed Du Bois's book, The World in Africa, which is probably one of my favorite books of Du Bois. And he claims it offers pioneering insights into the relation of the economic exploitation of Africa and the economic development of Europe, highlighting how the ideas concerning the inferiority of the Negro were used as a rationalization to justify the exploitation of Negro labor. This was a project that Fraser himself also was working upon in books such as Negro in the United States and Race and Culture Context in the Modern World, which was published in 1957. Alongside this kind of engagement with Du Bois, Fraser is actually criticizing members of the Chicago School, notably Robert Park. And this is what I found really interesting, especially because so many people see Fraser as basically being a logical extension of Robert Park's race relations sociology. But Fraser is actually saying at the same time as he's engaging with Du Bois, that people like Robert Park are really failing to take into account what he says are the ecological, economic, and political aspects of race relations, which creates a static conception which omits the dynamic aspects of race relations themselves. So in other words, even though many people were arguing that Fraser was basically Robert Park 2.0, he's engaging much more explicitly with Du Bois, and he's actually rejecting the central tenets of Park's sociology. You see a kind of similar story with Drake. He didn't dedicate a book to Du Bois, but he did title one of his books, Black Folk Here and There, published in 1991. And it was titled that as a homage to Du Bois's own Black Folk Then and Now. A year after Du Bois's death in 1964, Drake actually delivers a talk in honor of Du Bois at Roosevelt University. And just like Fraser, in this speech, Drake praised Du Bois's provocation of the problem of the 20th century being the problem of the color line. And likewise, he also singled out Du Bois's The World in Africa, commenting on how the book demonstrated that Negro Americans would suffer as long as Africa was colonized and vilified. So in this respect, Drake argues that Du Bois also pioneered the way for understanding this link between the exploitation of Black Americans and Black Africans, arguing that his historical sociological studies led the way in demonstrating how in defending Africa, they were defending themselves against the charge of a people without the past, 
and of being descendants of savage and uncivilized people. Of special importance to Drake was really that Du Bois' research across these pieces like The World in Africa and Black Folk Then and Now demonstrated that the unsavory stereotypes of Africa had no scientific corroboration. So this was again a project which Drake went to develop through his own Black Folk Here and There, which tracks the history of Black civilizations and also a work he was unable to complete in his lifetime, Africa and a Black Diaspora, which I'm sure we'll discuss later on in this podcast. Finally, one thing I found really interesting about Drake and the Chicago School is that even though many people read him as being an acolyte of Lloyd Warner, the person that Drake praises the most from the Chicago School is actually Addison Davis. And importantly, Drake views Addison Davis as himself being a protege of Du Bois. So really the first part of my paper is about demonstrating this misrepresentation or maybe over-exaggeration of Frazier and Drake as being Chicago school microethnographers. And instead, I look a bit more at their engagement with Du Bois and their relationship with Du Bois. The second half of the paper turns a bit more explicitly to discussing not only how these two thinkers praised Du Bois, but also how they were fundamentally influenced by his social scientific approach. Hey, I definitely want to know more about how they were influenced by Du Bois and his approach, but your description of Frazier and Drake and their engagement with the Chicago School, the fact they were graduate students at U of C, Mm -hmm. they worked with these very well-known sociologists. Mm -hmm. It makes me think, obviously, Du Bois never directed a PhD program, Mm -hmm. right? He was on and off at uh, Atlanta University, Mm -hmm. we could say. He had quite a bit of engagements outside the university with his work with the NAACP and the crisis during this period of time. And so if you're a person like Frazier and Drake, like where do you go to graduate school? I guess kind of my question is, why does Chicago make sense? Mm -hmm. What do you think about why Chicago makes sense for these two scholars, especially with Park there, with the micro sociology tradition there, with the city as laboratory Mm -hmm. there. Can you say something about that? Yeah, sure. That's such an interesting question. And uh, now that you've raised it, it's something which I want to write about more in the overall project. You're right that Chicago makes sense for so many reasons. It's kind of the place to be at that time if you were interested in doing ethnographic studies of race in America. And coupled with that, we also shouldn't forget that the Chicago School were also doing comparative historical research on race and empire. Zena Magabane's written this amazing paper about, for example, Robert Park's pre-ethnographic sociology, which really is historical sociology. And I think what's really important to note is not just that people like Drake and Frazier were at Chicago because it made sense, but that they did actually encounter people there who fundamentally shaped their sociology. And it would be wrong to say that they didn't have any kind of relation to the Chicago school. My argument instead is that the Chicago school only had so much influence on them. And even within the Chicago school, there were certain figures who were influencing Drake and Frazier who are not necessarily written into that history of the Chicago school itself. Addison Davis is a really good case in point here. Addison Davis employs Drake as a research assistant for his project looking at Black American identity and exploitation in the US South. And throughout his career, Drake repeatedly refers back to Addison Davis as being a pioneer of what later became termed as Black sociology. And it's this piece in the archive called In the Mirror of Black Scholarship, which is where he kind of has this Mm. really uh, amazing praise of Addison Davis. And it's here where he again draws this parallel between Davis and Du Bois. And he says that both of them were basically pioneering this iteration of sociology, which was not value neutral, which was kind of what the mainstream Chicago school were trying to push. But it was showing that sociological research can be value laden and objective at the same time. And that folks like Du Bois and Alison Davis were really leading the charge in that regard. And Fraser and Drake carried on that tradition of really doing what we would call scientific sociology, which very obviously was engaged in social issues and done with the aim of improving social conditions of not just Black Americans, but of colonized and racialized subjects transnationally. You make me think about George Herbert Mead, right? Uh-huh. Who's in a slightly earlier phase in the Chicago school, yeah. who does all of this work. Some of it we would praise today, some of it we would have sure. deep concern about. But talk about a person who is engaged in the city of Chicago and trying to understand and work with settlement and resettlement and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then you get the park generation, Mm -hmm. which then you get Du Bois' critique of car window. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The older I get, the more I am interested in this stuff. Well, you know, it it kind of reminds me of Earl Wright talks a bit about Jim Crow sociology. Yeah. And how... 
in the 20th century, there were just a bunch of really influential Black sociologists, and they all had to read each other, but they also all had to read people on the other side of the veil as such. Mm -hmm. People like Fraser, Drake, Addison Davis, as we mentioned, they all had to read each other, and they were all reading Du Bois and other members of the Atlanta Sociological Lab and so on. Uh, but they also had to engage with all, all of these mainstream sociologists that you've been mentioning, which would also be the kind of, let's call them uncritical white sociologists yeah. who were producing stereotypes of Black Americans. Yeah, and in the case of some of those white sociologists doing very community-engaged work with ethnic groups we would call white today, mm -hmm. yeah, but not doing so much on the South side so to speak, yeah. you know, sort yeah. of in their own neighborhood. Yeah. And I think that that carried on for a while, especially in Chicago. I'm I'm trying to remember which book it's in. I think it might be in Loic Bacon's Urban Outcasts or maybe Prisons of Poverty. And he was talking about when he was a graduate student in Chicago and how they were told never to go to the South Side. And that's years after people like Drake and Fraser are there. It's decades after they were there. And they still had that kind of attitude, which I'm sure has changed now because it's a really cool department. But yeah, there is a history there, let's say. I mean, I I've never been to the UFC, but it is on the South Side. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> University is a safe haven, I guess, or that's how they were perceiving it. Well, let's talk about how these folks were actually influenced by Du Bois. You know, they couldn't directly study under him as PhD students, but as you've said, their work was often dedicated to and responsive to and deeply in conversation with. Du Bois. So how were they influenced by Du Bois and his work? Yeah, and I, I really like the way you set up that question as well, because as you said, they didn't do their PhDs under him. But Fraser, for example, worked under Du Bois at Atlanta as a research associate. And later on, when Du Bois gets kicked out of Atlanta, he actually asks Fraser for a job at Howard. But Fraser wasn't able to make it happen because the president of Howard was not happy with Du Bois's relationship to the Communist Party or to, or to communism more broadly. But anyways, back to your question. In the paper, I argued that Drake and Fraser practiced these three main components of Du Boisian sociology to excavate the global color line, studying the durable and malleable nature of racial dehumanization and exploitation. Secondly, to understand the color line from a variety of methodological perspectives. And lastly, to work with and learn from anti-racist and anti-colonial activists in forming one's analysis of the global color line. I argue that Drake and Fraser do all three of these things. And in doing those three things, they're also citing and engaging with Du Bois at a really deep level. So let's start with Fraser. Following Du Bois, Fraser argued that while racism in the United States has many unique features, it is nevertheless a phase of a world process. And to Fraser, but also to Drake, they were both primarily interested in studying this world process shaped by racism and colonial capitalism. Fraser, for instance, argued that the world was constituted by different racial frontiers, each frontier developing as an offshoot to what Du Bois called the global color line. So much of Fraser's work here actually sounds really familiar or really similar to Du Bois's own musings. Just as Du Bois commented that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, that is, the relation of the darker to the lighter races, Fraser echoes this provocation in his piece Racial Problems in World Society, stating that there are sound reasons, ideological, pragmatic, and sociological, for defining the problems of race in modern world society in terms of the relations of white and colored peoples. Fraser's sociological program was thus premised on the historical and comparative analysis between different racial frontiers in the hope of isolating common general expressions of the same global color line. Fraser's work on a global color line involved, for example, the relationship between capitalism, enslavement in the US and indentured labor in the British colonies, or indeed demonstrating how British and American migration to Brazil and the Caribbean created a more rigid system of racial classification and segregation in these regions. Indeed, people might be familiar with Fraser's Black Bourgeoisie. I would say that's probably his most well-known text in um, American sociology. And it's in this book where he chastises the American Black middle class, but it's in his Race and Culture Context in the Modern World, which was also published in the same year, 1956, where he argues that the American Black middle class are to the American racial frontier what the colonial bourgeoisie are to the settler and tropical frontiers. In both cases, he argues that this group basically function as a set of colored middlemen, and they help to naturalize racial exploitation and support white capital growth. So even in Fraser's critique of the American Black bourgeoisie, which is quite well known, 
he's not just talking about the American racial order, but he's really talking about race, class, and the color line much more transnationally. And what's really important in my paper is to highlight how Fraser was actually developing this work on a global color line in conjunction with anti-colonial figures, especially Eric Williams, with whom he ran a conference on the Caribbean at Howard in 1943. And Fraser claims that it was Williams, among other post-colonial intellectuals, especially of the Pan-African tradition, who were really encouraging him to forge this transnational analysis of racial frontiers and to understand the relationship between racial frontiers more broadly. And indeed, Fraser even argues that it was Eric Williams who enlivened his interest in the Caribbean much more broadly. So the Caribbean is important for this conversation because it's in this analysis of this region where you really see how Fraser pivots towards a very explicitly Du Boisian framework rather than the earlier mentioned Chicago School framework of race relations. So he has this paper presented at the Fourth World Congress of Sociology in 1959, and it's here where Fraser puts forward a view of the Caribbean racial frontier as in fact transcending the geography of the Caribbean. As he puts it, the study of the West Indies as a racial frontier naturally leads us to England, where the migration of West Indian Negroes has created an important area for the study of race relations in Europe. So here, Fraser is actually explicitly criticizing Robert Park and his account of race relations, saying he does not pay sufficient attention to how race relations cycles can actually transcend national borders. And he states that the case of the Caribbean migration to Britain brings to a full circle the cycle of race relations which began with the expansion of the European or white race, which created the racial frontiers in the modern world. The descendants of those who manned the slave ships to the West Indies are rubbing shoulders today with the descendants of the slaves on the streets, in the marketplaces, and in the factories of England. So here we're really seeing how Fraser aligns much more with Du Bois than with Park in the way that he isolates modern race relations dynamics and the very existence of racial frontiers to their colonial foundations. And Britain offers a really good empirical case from which we can jump to St. Clair, because this is precisely where he conducted his fieldwork between 1947 to 1948. FYI, that's two years after the publication of Black Metropolis. People find it quite surprising that he's most well known for a text he wrote before he even had a PhD. So anyway, Drake's in Britain in 1947 to 1948 for his PhD dissertation, which was entitled Blacks in the British Isles. And just as Fraser used this notion of racial frontiers, Drake, through this PhD dissertation and through the rest of his corpus of scholarship, believed that the global color line gets expressed through different race relations action situations across different geopolitical regions. And like Fraser, Drake contends that one needs to use comparative analysis between these different race relations action situations as a means to study the global color line in general. And in fact, the comparative analysis of different contact or action situations in order to excavate the global color line is precisely the philosophy that originally underlined Drake's PhD project on race relations in Britain. When Drake received a grant to conduct this doctoral research, he had pitched this study as a means of developing a comparative global study of race, ethnicity, and social stratification that would use the residential area of Tiger Bay in Cardiff in Wales, as well as Liverpool in England, as a point of comparison with the Chicago he studied in Black Metropolis. It was through this comparative analysis that Drake came to discredit the myth of American racial exceptionalism, and he showed that the same color line which created deep fissures in American society was also being expressed across the Atlantic. The system of racialized residential segregation, coupled with a caste-like color bar in the economy, for example, was realized in Bronzeville, Chicago, just as much as Tiger Bay, Cardiff, and, as he states in the conclusion of his dissertation, is likewise similar to the major cities of Kenya, such as Nairobi and Mombasa, and the major cities of the Union of South Africa. So this comparative approach to understanding urban expressions of the same global color line was an undercurrent which ran throughout Drake's intellectual career, but especially in the first decades. Traveling to Ghana and Liberia in the 1950s on a Ford Fellowship, before taking up the post as department chair of sociology at the University of Ghana between 1958 to 61, as well as shorter research trips across West Africa and the Caribbean, Drake even commented in 1961 that he has been struck by the similarities and constants in the urbanization process in all of these diverse places, whether one is dealing with Chicago, London, 
Wales, or Ghana, and the Congo. In his Some Observations on Inter-Ethnic Conflict as One Type of Intergroup Conflict, written in 1957, he even demonstrates that the US South can be understood in similar terms to the settler society of Kenya, where quickly rising levels of economic competition between dominant and subdominant groups gives rise to the most intense expressions of ethno-racial violence and racial caste exclusion. So similarly to Fraser, in this discussion of racial conflict, once again, Drake is actually explicitly rejecting the sociology of Robert Park, here for lacking a comparative dimension. And instead, he embraces a much more Du Boisian principle of global and transnational analysis, calling for further research on the comparative study of ethnic caste between African societies and caste systems in other parts of the world, such as the United States. He argues that this comparative analysis will enable us to produce a general theory of violence and the global color line. However, despite Drake's constant interest in urbanization, he even says himself that it's not really ever been his primary intellectual concern. So again, we're thinking about this misrepresentation of Drake as being primarily an ethnographer. So Drake's intellectual journey here relates once again to his doctoral fieldwork. When he was in Britain in 47 and 48, he comments on how he met a number of Africans who had participated in the Fifth Pan-African Congress, including George Padmore and Kwame Nkrumah, and also contemporary radicals such as C.L.R. James. And Drake argues that here, despite being in Britain to conduct ethnographic research, he became aware that important developments were impending in Africa, and that his interests therefore shifted from what he calls community studies to what he calls macroscopic problems, especially the Pan-African movement. And it was in his so-called macroscopic turn that Drake's research methods became increasingly historical as per the Du Boisian tradition again. Taking inspiration from Evans Pritchard, Drake claims that to know a society's past give one's a deeper understanding of the nature of its social life at the present time. However, as an historical sociologist interested in the global color line, Drake saw himself slightly as a lone figure. He lamented the fact that historical sociology, aside from Du Bois's works, had yet to properly engage with the roots and transformations of the global color line. So as he claims in his Afro-American History in Pan-African Perspective, written in 1975, he argues we still do not have a comparative study of types of adjustment of African populations in varied ecological and cultural settings, and to shifts from enslavement to other systems of subordination and exploitation. He laments that historians have been much more concerned with descriptive integration than with comparative analysis. So much like Fraser, Drake's faith in comparative analysis led him to argue that one must transcend methodological nationalism if they are to properly understand the color line. As he explained, a plethora of works are available on specific Black communities in the Western Hemisphere and on race relations, but much less attention has been given to the problem of relationships between the scattered communities of the Black diaspora and their relations with the homeland. He argued in this context that one fruitful approach to handling this problem is is through what might be called an analysis of flows of people, ideas, and artifacts between the diaspora communities at varied time levels. So in order to engage in this relational comparative analysis, Drake argues that the historical sociologist's analysis needs to focus not on the nation state, but on the intelligible unit of what he calls the Black experience, or more precisely, the Black world. So here, Drake's really taking on Du Bois' provocation to uncover Black life beyond the veil, but he's taking this provocation to the global level, highlighting the flow of people, artifacts, commodities, and ideas within the Black world globally. This becomes the focus of his book, Africa and the Black Diaspora, which I alluded to earlier, and he never managed to complete before his death in 1990. But again, I'm sure we'll discuss this book in a bit more detail in, in a few minutes. And importantly, just like how Du Bois' interest in the global color line was fueled by his lessons from anti-colonial activists, Drake's interest in the historical and comparative study of the Black world was likewise influenced by contemporary Black radicals. As he comments, it was through an engagement with Black radical communities and conferences that he came to even note the validity of studying the Black world in the first place. He states it was through his attendance at the All African People's Conference in Accra in 1958, as well as attending the first festival of Negro art in Dakar in 1966, along with his research trips to Africa and the Caribbean and his professorship in Ghana, where, as he says, the unity of the Black experience, despite differences in time, place, and culture, became increasingly salient to him. And again, as he says, his teachers were not professional social scientists, but rather it was George Padmore, Kwame Nkrumah, and Sekou Toure, as well as C.L.R. James, 
who were the teachers who stressed the validity of the Black experience. So finally, much like Frazier, Drake lamented that his American contemporaries did not often think alongside such anti-colonial radicals. He criticizes Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, for instance, for ignoring the intellectual thought of Nkrumah, Touré, Cabral, and younger scholars such as Magubane. Pedagogically, Drake sought to bring these anti-colonial thinkers into his classroom, emphasizing that as the world moved into a post-colonial era, Black students cannot understand the world if they're not familiar with Walter Rodney and if they're not familiar with the works of Nkrumah, Padmore, Cabral, and Manley. So in sum, Drake and Fraser did not just praise the boys as we talked about earlier, but they were also fundamentally influenced by him. And my paper is really just trying to do some work in telling this story of influence. And in doing so, I hope it at least marginally moves us forward in our understanding of the Du Boisian tradition. I really enjoyed the part of your paper where you're talking about how Drake is engaging with these folks in Britain, Padmore, these Black radical decolonial figures. Mm -hmm. And it does make me think about where theorists find their inspiration or how they get inspired to think about the problems, their tradition differently or or the area in which they study differently by being in activist spaces mm -hmm. or being in radical spaces, whether that's the Black radical tradition you know, within the United States or anti-colonial or decolonial movement leaders in Europe and, of course, on the continent of Africa as well. We can think about how sociology might be influenced by a closer read of the freedom struggle folks, including folks like Walter Rodney, including people like Huey Newton and Bobby Seal, mm. uh, Erica Huggins, other many of these people actually have sociology backgrounds. Ra exactly. Ralph yeah. Abernathy has a, I think his undergrad was in um, sociology. Of course, Dr. King did mm -hmm. sociology at Morehouse, as most people know. But I've been pondering this ever since I read in your paper about Rodney and Padmore and the Kruma and these these mm -hmm. other folks who are not, you know, they're not on the reading list in grad, at least in my experience, they're not on the reading list in grad school in sociology. Yeah, yeah, this is such a good question, and um, well, I, I guess I re I'm already on the podcast, so I'll plug I'll plug another piece that I wrote, which was in um, sociological theory recently. It was called from public sociology to sociological publics. And that's kind of the argument that I talk about in that paper is to really think about how anti-colonial activists have historically shaped professional sociology and how we might actually return to that kind of dynamic in the contemporary era. And if you actually look at the history of sociology, there are so many examples of this kind of activism feeding into professional sociology. And Drake is such a good case in point, because as we've already been discussing, he goes to England, he encounters all of these anti-colonial intellectuals. He's there at the All African People's Party Congress in 1958, where he sits next to Fanon, and so one day he's kind of there, and then the next day he's back teaching at Roosevelt University or for a, for a stint at Stanford. And he's kind of not necessarily seeing the divide between the classroom and these really radical anti-colonial spaces as being very strong, but the divide between them is porous. And the knowledge being produced mm -hmm. in both places is valuable. So it could be that one day he's listening about the necessity for violence in anti-colonial struggles, and the next day he's teaching about that to his students in um, Roosevelt University or, or at Stanford. Even before him with Du Bois, Du Bois even says himself that his understanding of the color line as being a global color line was something that occurred to him after attending the first Pan-African Congress in 1900 in England and after attending the 1911 London Universal Race Congress. So even Du Bois, who is a so-called founding figure of empirical sociology, was saying that his empirical sociology was shaped by anti-colonial activism. So for sure, I think that that's a narrative that, that we need to kind of think about a bit more explicitly. And just to come to your final point, which was that, you know, Padmore and Nkrumah aren't typically on our graduate reading lists. I'm reminded of Julian Goh's recent work on anti-colonial thought as social theory, where he's really making the point, which seems obvious <laughs> after you read it, that in order to resist this kind of world of exploitation and colonial capitalism, lots of anti-colonial figures needed to properly theorize what was even going on in the first place. And the way that they theorized and the kinds of things they were theorizing about was not different to what was happening in sociological theory. So you can't even read this long history of activism as itself being an example of sociological theorizing. And I think that we're gradually seeing more sociologists kind of wake up to that reality. And we're seeing more sociologists 
engage in a research program of kind of uncovering previous sociological theorizing, which was excluded from the canon. It's all really good. I want to go back, though. I'm convinced that Du Bois thought has influenced a lot of other folks. Uh huh. You think you're right that many sociologists have not followed up on how that has actually worked, even though many have written really excellent books and articles mm -hmm. using Du Bois and Du Bois's concepts and theories, and that being the way his thought developed. So what's your take on why sociologists haven't so much followed up broadly on those who came alongside and after Du Bois, those folks who were influenced by his thought, particularly in terms of global studies of colonialism along the color line? Mm -hmm. That's such a good question. So, I mean, firstly, I think that if you look at it historically, there has been a great need for sociologists to, first of all, just look at the works of Du Bois himself before we are able to be in a place to start thinking about the True. other members of the Du Boisian tradition. And again, this reminds me of something which is coming out soon. It's an editorial in Sociology Compass with entries from myself, Muge Gocek, Michael Burrowoy, Alden Morris, and Jose Itzigzin. And we kind of make this argument that even before Alden Morris's Squad is Denied, which was published in 2015, there was engagement with Du Bois, but it was quite sporadic. So figures between the 50s and 80s, such as Joyce Ladner, St. Clair Drake, who we've already mentioned, Addison Davis, who we've mentioned, Elliot Rudwig, Francis Broderick, they've all published papers, given speeches, or even organized whole conferences where they try to reclaim Du Bois's legacy as in Alison Davis's words, the best empirical American sociologist of his time. Even beyond these figures in the early 2000s, you have Michael Burrowoy claiming Du Bois as a prototypical public sociologist in his ASA address, and Patricia Hill Collins praising his work on race, community, and democracy, also in her ASA plenary. Alongside this, you also have people like L. Wright, who I think I've already mentioned, who was doing a lot of work on Du Bois's crafting of the Atlanta Sociological Lab. So then as you move into the 21st century, especially after after Morris's 2015 Scholar Denied, what you see is that you also have lots of different communities of sociologists uncovering different aspects of Du Bois' work. You have post-colonial sociologists like Julian Go, Ricardo Hammer, and Katrina King, all highlighting Du Bois's critical insights into race and empire. Jose Itzigsen and Carita Brown's analysis of Du Bois's notion of colonial racial capitalism. You have figures like Loic Bacant highlighting Du Bois as a pioneer of ethnography, Figures like Earl Wright and Kalesha O.J. writing about Du Bois's connection to the Black sociological tradition. Figures like Cedric de Leon and Michael Rodriguez Munez thinking about Du Bois as a political sociologist. And people like Whitney Battle Baptiste doing work on recovering Du Bois's legacy in pioneering data visualizations. And that's just sociology. You also have people in political theory and IR like Adam Getachew thinking about Du Bois's contributions to political theory and decolonization broadly. So I'm saying all of this because it's really just to show how much Du Bois actually wrote, how much he did and how much he achieved in his lifetime. And I think straightforwardly, simply uncovering what Du Bois wrote about, what he stood for and what he achieved is itself such a massive task which is still unfolding. And even now we have the UMass Amherst who have digitalized the Du Bois archive. This means that there oh, yeah. is thousands and th yeah, right. So it means there are thousands of things to read relating to um, Du Bois' scholarship and his intellectual and political networks. So, you know, straightforwardly, I think part of the reason why most of the work on the Du Boisian tradition focuses just on Du Bois is simply because we're still uncovering what Burrowoy calls, we're still restructuring the works of Du Bois and trying to do a project on Du Boisian sociology before first having a firm grounding in Du Bois' scholarship would probably be slightly unwise. But very quickly, I think, you know, we're now in a position where we don't know everything, but we know enough about Du Bois to start this broader reconstruction of the Du Boisian tradition as a whole. It's an intellectual project that requires rethinking some figures in sociology, such as Fraser and Drake, as we've been talking about. But it's also an opportunity for us to think about who was also influencing Du Bois. His notion of the veil and double consciousness, for instance, seems to be lifting analysis from A.J. Cooper's earlier work. So again, I'd like to emphasize that I'm among many people who are doing this work of thinking through the wider remits of the Du Boisian tradition. And I wouldn't like to paint the picture of suggesting that I'm only one of a few people doing this work. Earl Wright's been doing this work for quite a long time, tracking the multiple members of the Atlanta Sociological Lab who worked alongside Du Bois. Jorge Daniel Vasquez just published this brilliant paper looking at the relationship between Du Bois and Irene Diggs. Jose Itzigsen and Carita Brown's book, which I mentioned earlier, 
They even conclude their book on Du Bois by encouraging us to think about Du Bois's influence and intellectual exchanges with other anti-colonial folks like Claudia Jones, A.J. Cooper, and C.L.R. James. So I think we're in a good place now to start thinking about the multiple members of the Du Boisian tradition. And I'll just say that I'm glad to be part of such an interesting sociological community in this current time, where loads of us are stressing the need to learn more about the history of sociology in order to practice it better in the contemporary and future iterations of the discipline. I'm glad you mentioned that last part. One of the traps I think we fall into is to think that historical studies within our own discipline and asking questions about the shape of mm -hmm. different research traditions and lines of inquiry and so forth is meaningless navel gazing when in fact there are other, you know, more important contemporary kinds of issues to be tackled and not to say that it's not true that there aren't important contemporary issues to be tackled. But the fact that you're saying, well, if we think about how our discipline and we really study how our discipline has developed the roads traveled and then the scholars and traditions and questions not investigated, then we can both recover some insights from the past, but also use those insights to forge new paths in different directions for future scholarship. So let me say a couple of other things. So one, the system at UMass with many of Du Bois papers, it's a massive archive. But for folks who don't know, there is a meeting every Monday morning, US time, with the folks at UMass in the archive. It's called Breakfast with Du Bois. And so for those of us in the United States, it starts at 9.30 a.m. every Monday morning via Zoom. And so it started before the pandemic, maybe in a transition to Zoom. But there's a group of people who every Monday morning read something from Du Bois's archive. It ranges quite broadly, but it's very, very fun. People read, actually read Du Bois out loud in a Zoom setting. And it's some academics, some community members, some people who just like Du Bois and want to be involved. So very interesting and fun community to be involved with. And then secondly, we definitely need to have Earl Wright on, <laughs> on the show um, for sure. Cool. Yeah, his work is so great. A digitalized archive with so many resources, it's, it's quite the undertaking. And it's also a really useful teaching resource. I use a lot of the materials in there in, in my teaching on Du Bois as well. And it's a great archive. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about archives in a second, but we've been talking about Drake's unfinished book, Africa <laughs> and the Black Diaspora, and how he aimed to put the Black world from colonialism and enslavement through abolition, anti-colonialism, and freedom struggles into one analytic framework. So first of all, boy, what a project. It sounds yeah. absolutely magisterial to pull all of that off in one text or even series of texts. So how much of this work was completed? What can you say maybe about the shape mm -hmm. of it? And then what, if anything, is happening with that manuscript? Do you know? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. So I'm really glad you asked about this because it's probably one of the more exciting things which we found in the archive. This this is all held at the Schomburg archive up in, up in Harlem, which we'll talk about later. So Drake had this project, Africa and the Black Diaspora, he regularly mentioned this book in speaking engagements as being his magnum opus. He said it would be the first book to take the Black world as the primary intelligible unit, studying, as you said, not only the history of colonialism and enslavement, but also the histories of abolition, anti-colonialism, and freedom struggles from the 1500s all the way into the 20th century. Drake said that this book would create a framework through which Africa and the peoples of the diaspora can be analyzed within a single unified frame of reference. And while this book was never published in Drake's lifetime, as we've mentioned, the the drafted chapters show his commitment to a comparative and historical sociology, emphasizing how Black insurgency constituted, in his words, an integral part of the universal fight for human liberation. So as I said, the Schomburg archive holds dozens of drafted chapters for this book, as well as the research materials that Drake had collected to write it in the first place. And my opinion, at least, is that these chapters probably can be brought together and the book could be published posthumously. It is something that I'm trying to work on at the moment, but the main issue, of course, is to do with the rights to the, to the monograph which exist with his daughter, who is, let's say, being slightly unresponsive to my emails. So on the off chance that she's listening to this, it would be cool to uh, <laughs> have a fuller conversation with her about this, because I think it's such an amazing book that would really speak to historians just as much as sociologists and would speak to faculty just as much as undergraduate and graduate students. I just think it's an amazing resource. And there are Probably two things worth saying about this unpublished book, which I can go through fairly quickly. Firstly, Drake starts working on this book 
fairly late in his career. So he's working on it in the 1970s and 80s. And it's at this stage where he's primarily seeing himself as an historical sociologist. As Drake says of this period, he came to believe that the most meaningful research revolves around the points at which social structure, history, and biography intersect. And his book, Africa and the Black Diaspora, was supposed to practice this kind of vision of sociology, analyzing social structure through a focus on racialization, colonialism, and decolonization through historical analysis in a way that was also bringing biological light to central figures in Black liberation struggles, including Du Bois, who we've been talking about quite a lot. And then secondly, as I alluded to earlier, Africa and the Black Diaspora is also an intellectual project, which Drake argues was fundamentally influenced by his social network of anti-colonial activists, such as C.L.R. James, George Padmore, and Kwame Nkrumah. And C.L.R. James has this great quote, which reads, the Negro's revolutionary history is rich, inspiring, and unknown. The docile Negro is a myth. And I read Drake's Africa and the Black Diaspora as precisely filling this void which C.L.R. James is describing. He's showing that ever since there has been colonialism and enslavement, there's also been struggles for decolonization and abolition. And in fact, that the Black agency crafted through these struggles has been one of the main driving forces of history. So lastly, I would just add that one reason why I discuss Drake's unpublished book in my paper is because of its connections also to the works of Fraser and Du Bois. Africa and a Black Diaspora, in terms of what Drake was hoping to achieve with it, is really similar to Du Bois' Encyclopedia Africana project, which he was also unable to finish in his lifetime. And that was also not too distinct, again, to Fraser's 1957 Race and Culture Contacts in the Modern World, which Google Scholar claims has only been cited 350 times, which I was quite surprised by. All of these book projects aim to understand the agency of the Black diaspora, and they all aim to theorize the long-term effects and potential future transformations of the global color line. To come back to the crux of my paper, I think it's not a coincidence that these three figures all engaged in quite similar book projects. And indeed, you know, Du Bois even consulted Fraser and Drake for his encyclopedia project. They all shared epistemic ground in virtue of being Du Boisian sociologists. So we shouldn't be surprised they were also working on almost nearly identical book projects. Ali, you're in the archive and you find not only these manuscript chapters, but you find the background material mm -hmm. too. I mean, I've only been to one archive. I enjoyed my time there. I had very little time. So it was what my friend who does this work calls a smash and grab uh -huh. kind of job where you just have the archivists help you copy everything possible. Tell us what it was like to visit the archives for this paper, because you weren't only in New York, but you were other places as well. And then for folks who have not done this kind of work, what advice would you give them? Yeah, sure. That's a really interesting question. I like being asked it because you know, my training wasn't really in historical sociology. My training wasn't in archival methods. And in fact, in the UK, our empirical training is quite, let's call it lacking. So I was basically only really trained in interviews and I had to teach myself how to do historical sociology. And when I was working out how to do all of this stuff, I came across Damon Merrill and Nick Wilson's paper in Qualitative Sociology, which is called The Archive as a Social World. And I really love this paper and I really agree with its kind of basic argument. They highlight how we typically think of archival work as being quite a lonely process, right? In which the individual researcher sits alone at their desk with a pile of material to kind of work through. But in reality, archival work is inherently social. Most obviously, for example, as you've already mentioned, you need to work closely with the archival team throughout the entire process to even know which materials they hold in the archive that could be relevant to your project. But archival work is also social because there are whole communities of social sociologists and other academics interested in and doing archival research. And often you'll find yourself sharing bits of information, bits of, you know, hidden gems, which have yet to be widely shared within these communities. So just to clarify with an example from my own project, in lots of the Drake papers, uh, there's material relating to people like Oliver Cox and Walter Rodney. These are two figures one of my colleagues, uh, Zafia Edwards, is working on. So I'll pass on relevant material to her as and when I find it. I know Ricardo Hammer is doing excellent work on French and British anti-colonialism in the Caribbean. So materials from the Drake archive, once again, speak directly to these kinds of things. Themes. I know Loic Wicorn is interested in Addison Davis, so I'll send material to him when I think it would be helpful. There are other people like Michael Borrowoy doing their own archival work on Du Bois. So, you know, sharing helpful information with him 
such as Francis Broderick's collation of all of Du Bois's crisis editorials. Again, it just highlights the interactional nature of archival work. And indeed, the flow goes multiple ways. It was only yesterday Michael Borowoy sent through to me some archival documents on Du Bois being in conversation with Emmanuel Waterstein uh, on the topic mm. of Pan-Africanism, which you may have seen it was kind of going around Twitter as well. And this is, you know, what my next research project is on. So it was nice to kind of have other people also sending me archival work, which is relevant to what I'm kind of looking into. So to come back to the question, archives are truly social. And I would say it's important to approach archival research with this kind of ethic of collaboration there in the background of everything that you're doing. Then there's two other quick points. Firstly, I take a lot of inspiration from Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall's got this amazing piece called Constituting an Archive. Here, he points out that no archive exists out of thin air, but rather that they all have what he calls a prehistory. They needed to be constituted, and they were often constituted for very specific reasons. So in my own experience, one of the archives I've been working in a lot is the Schomburg Archive up in Harlem in New York. It was founded in the 1920s by the Black Puerto Rican Arturo Schomburg, and obviously has a connection to the Black radicalism and internationalism of Harlem in the 1920s onwards. So the Schomburg Center is interesting because it doesn't just hold historical documents, but it is history itself. And I say that because I think that being aware of the spaces in which you are doing archival work is, you know, incredibly important. And you have to also realize that there's a history behind the archive, despite the fact that archives also hold the history themselves. So it's kind of a bit of um, a, a doubled kind of recognition there. And then a last quick point, which is specifically for people doing work at Schomburg, which by the way, I'd recommend you go to if you ever visit New York um, in general, because they actually have a really cool store, they've got a museum, and they often run public events as well. But just five minutes walk away from the Schomburg Center is Sylvia's restaurant. And I think it's some of the best soul food I've ever had. And it makes for a really perfect lunch break. So you can get into a really cool routine where you do like five hours archival work or a few hours archival work, pop out, get some chicken and waffles, and then you go back until the archive closes and then you're done for the day. It's quite nice. That's worth it right there. I'm glad I asked the question <laughs> for the soul food recommendation. Sure. Sylvia's. Okay. Everyone remember Sylvia's next time uh, you're in the city. Now I can't wait till ASA comes back to New York. Well, I want to turn to my last, I guess, formal question for <laughs> pre banter. This is all pre banter. I understand that this article is part of a larger project that you're working on, on how Du Bois's thought influenced others. So can you tell us more about that? work. Yeah, sure. It's a good time to do this uh, podcast because I just got a book contract offer maybe two hours ago. Congratulations. Voice project. Thanks so much. So yeah, you caught me in, in a good mood and had a good time. The book project is really just kind of expanding upon some of the central claims from this paper. So firstly, the main kind of point is that we've got to a stage where we now know a lot about Du Bois. We know a lot about the Du Boisian tradition, but we know very little about the Du Boisian tradition beyond the works of Du Bois. And so the book project is really just trying to advance that space to an extent. So I'm looking at the dialogues between Du Bois, Drake and Fraser, as we've already been talking about, but then also Ida B. Wells and Anna Julia Cooper, as, as you mentioned at the very beginning of this uh, podcast episode. And one of the things that I can kind of go into in a bit more depth in the book, which I didn't really have the opportunity to in the paper, was also thinking about the conversations that developed between these five thinkers themselves, but also the four thinkers. So kind of leaving out Du Bois and thinking about the influence between the other people who were also in conversation with each other. One thing I mentioned in passing in the paper is that Drake actually says in his reflections on anthropology and the Black experience, which he writes in the 70s, that of all sociologists, Frazier was his main intellectual hero. And we've already kind of mentioned Frazier's notion of racial frontiers. That concept itself bears a really close resemblance to um, Drake's notion of race relations, action situations. So, you know, one could actually just write a whole paper about Frazier and Drake and their dialogues with each other. And that's kind of what I'm trying to also work out with this book is not just who were the Du Boisians, but how did the Du Boisians influence each other? So this is where a parallel with the Marxist tradition or other traditions of sociology can become useful again. If you consider studying the Marxist tradition, one looks at how Marx influenced Gramsci, but they also look at how Marxist thinkers were influencing each other. So for example, the relationship between Gramsci and Althusser. And I kind of contend that we now need to do the same with the Du Boisian tradition. 
where we don't just look at, for instance, the Bois' influence on Drake and Fraser, but also Drake and Fraser's relationship to one another. I'm hoping, at least, that that's eventually what the book is going to look like. But really, just the base principle is to move forward our understanding of the Du Boisian tradition so that we stop thinking about Du Bois' scholarship as being synonymous to the Du Boisian tradition and instead see Du Bois' scholarship as being important to the Du Boisian tradition, but not the only iteration of it. You know, I had another thought about this question about why sociologists haven't taken up the folks who were strongly influenced by Du Bois and were working alongside him sometimes as as a case of of Frazier. This is a hypothesis only, and I'm just speculating wildly. Uh But it strikes me that if we were to confine the Du Boisian tradition to Du Bois, I mean, first Mm -hmm. of all, there's no such thing as a tradition without followers and people who advance or take up those ideas. You know, we we can't talk about the Marxist tradition or Marxist sociology without doing some of this work that you just laid out with these figures and others, of course. But in the case of Du Bois, corralling him and saying what we need to know about Du Boisian sociology is confined within the admittedly Mm -hmm. monumental work. The function of like corralling him off is actually to make him such a special figure Mm -hmm. that then you can just be like, I learned my Du Bois, let's set him aside and go work in another tradition because Du Bois has said all the things that need to be said. And of course, that's an injustice, not only to his work, but also to these figures that you're talking about in this paper and then the wider book project and others Mm -hmm. as well, the folks that Earl Wright talks about and so forth. Yeah, I mean, that's such a good observation and I would completely agree with it. I think that it kind of relates to two, two themes that I think about quite a lot. One of them is that the canon of Du Bois needs to be a separate process to the exaltation of Du Bois. Um, Mm. That we need to kind of note that even if we want to canonize Du Bois as a founding figure of sociology, it doesn't mean that he was infallible. And that actually, the more we learn about him, the more we should be able to kind of feel confident in our critiques of him and in the absences or so-called blind spots of his um, sociological theorizing. But the second point, I think, is just, it's really interesting to see these kind of let's call them intellectual battles or kind of intellectual joust. Is jousting, does jousting translate to the US? Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, these in- This intellectual jousting over the boys. You know, earlier I was kind of saying how different sociological communities have all kind of got a different reading of Du Bois. And for some people, this is bad for sociology. So, you know, Nick Wilson, I mentioned him earlier. Uh, I met him in New York earlier this year. Really big fan of his work, so I was really glad to be able to meet him. And his opinion, if I remember correctly, was basically that he's worried that Du Bois is going to become another Weber or another Marx, where instead of being a source of community building and sociology, he's actually used as a source for writing, Mm. where it's like, our Du Bois is more correct than your Du Bois. And these kind of quests for having the correct interpretation of Du Bois is seen in a negative sense. Likewise, Ben Carrington just wrote this really interesting piece about Du Bois in an edited collection called Disciplinary Futures, published by NYU Press. And he says, certain people want to claim Du Bois the American positivist social scientist, but they don't want to claim Du Bois the poet or Du Bois the activist or whatever, right? Ben Carrington even says if Du Bois applied for a job in US sociology now, he would probably be told to apply to African American studies departments at the best. So some people kind of see sources of conflict over Du Bois as being bad. I'm kind of following what Michael Borowoy is saying, where he's actually seeing this in a bit more of a positive light. The fact that you can have such conflict over one figure lets you know that that figure is having spheres of influence in multiple different areas of sociology. And as Borowoy knows, what we really do when we're reconstructing traditions like the Du Boisian tradition is we're not just saying this is one correct interpretation but rather we're almost putting forward an interpretation and hoping that other people have different interpretations so that we can actually move forward through that mm-hmm. disagreement through dialogue. So yeah, just that was a long way of agreeing with what you were saying. I think that's really important. And the idea that it would be reasonable or a good thing to put Du Bois in one camp or to identify him with like one stream of sociology just seems wrongheaded to me because it doesn't allow Du Bois to be Du Bois as a scholar who has lots of different interests and is responsive to his time. I mean, the guy's writing editorials in the crisis Mm -hmm. every month, right? And he's, I mean, he even had like a a column where he was, I think this is right, where he was like answering reader questions. Yeah. Yeah. If I remember correctly. Yeah. 
And so the idea that we can say he's this kind of thinker or that kind of thinker denies the kind of development that we all should have, I think, mm -hmm. in our scholarly careers, whether that's one as monumental as Du Bois's or one that's more um, yeah. uh, closer to the median, I'll put, <laughs> put it that way. One thing that annoys me, I said earlier that there's no one correct interpretation of Du Bois, and I'll stand by that. But with a bit of inconsistency, I'll say that one narrative which does slightly annoy me is that Du Bois was first a sociologist of Black America and then became interested in kind of empire and colonialism and transnational sociology. And for me, I find that reading really peculiar because, you know, his PhD, which later became published as The Suppression of the African Slave Trade, was a global and transnational historical sociology of enslavement and abolition, mm -hmm. which incorporated a focus well beyond the remit of the US. And I think that what Du Bois was doing so well was he was showing how racism in the US was part of a global story. Even his most micro-ethnographic study of, you know, the Philadelphia Negro, at the very end of it, he has this quote about how racism is a global process in which we give full citizenship to white people and then deny it by more and more as we work down a racial hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So that's the only interpretation of Du Bois, which I have slight issues with. But I think that it's becoming less common as we know more about Du Bois' scholarship. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that. I think that a common periodization that people make. Mm. Of course, he spends time in Germany as well early in his career. Uh, JT talks about on the podcast, right? He was on yeah. uh, his book, yeah. And he's even in, you know, 1900, he's at the first ever Pan-African Congress. So, I mean, he was interested in all of these issues of empire and colonialism much earlier than some biographers give him credit for. Mm. Okay, well, I'm going to resist the temptation to speculate as <laughs> why that might be. Ali, this has been great. Let's turn to banter. And I heard already that you're a soul food fan. And uh -huh. this makes me think maybe you have other recent food experiences. Do you have any recent academic travel experiences and food recommendations to share? Yeah, for sure. Actually, um, food is one of my favorite things in the world. So cooking and eating are two of my top hobbies. <laughs> so yeah, yeah same. Um, so I was in Amsterdam only last week. I was doing no something. Way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No way. I'm going to Amsterdam next month. You're going to Amsterdam next month, in which case, hopefully at least one of these recommendations might be of use to you. I got my pad right here. All right, let's go for it. Uh, yeah, so last week I was in Amsterdam. I was actually doing a PhD defense in Leiden, which is like half an hour's train journey for, from Amsterdam. First time I've done a PhD defense in the Netherlands. It was a really surreal experience. The ones in the UK are relatively informal, whereas this was like a really kind of traditional experience. I got to wear this kind of ridiculous hat, which made me feel like I'd been moved to medieval times or something. But anyways, um, because I was going to be there for work, my wife, Emily, she joined for a few days in Amsterdam. And we went to this really cool kind of Japanese inspired restaurant called Taiko. It's just by the museum district. So it's really easy to get to by public transport. And so we started in a bar where they had like the most bizarre cocktails using flavors from East Asia. So one of the cocktails I remember was like a margarita style drink, but they were using kimchi in it to kind of give it that like really. Oh, wow. Deep yeah, it was like quite fascinating. Um, the drink I had was a Wagyu old fashioned. So it's bourbon washed with Wagyu fat with shiitake mushrooms and corn in it as well. Sounds really weird, but it, I stand by it. It was the best cocktail I've ever had in my life. Wow. And then we followed that by the restaurant, which was like an unbelievable tasting menu. You can kind of choose between five courses or eight courses, or you can order off the menu because they have loads of different stuff that you can kind of order. And my recommendation would be their black cod. It's black cod marinated in saffron and miso. Really, wow. really good. And then another place I recommend is called Cafe restaurant metro it's kind of in a slightly industrial area of amsterdam so like the vibe is quite different to, to the other restaurant but it, it was really good value it was like 40 euros for three courses which i'm not sure how that translates to dollars because i'm kind of translating it to british pounds in my head but i imagine it's a lot cheaper than the euro it's about the same the, the exchange like... rate right now is pretty close okay cool 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 but yeah i mean 40 euros 40 50 dollars for three courses really good food and they uh, double up as a wine bar. So their wine list was really extensive. But also my wife doesn't drink alcohol. And one thing that we found was that Amsterdam so far has been one of the best places we've been to for non-alcoholic drinks as well. Really, really good non-alcoholic wines and cocktails and stuff. 
So oh, good. He recommend Amsterdam. Great place. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. It's been a while since I've been there. And, you know, the U.S. has a lot of great things about it, but uh, easy travel to Europe is not one of the perks. That's one thing because I was, you know, contemplating moving to the U.S. And one of my mentors did say, you know, you can get a train to Paris where you are at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> takes a bit longer from <laughs> the other side of the Atlantic. It does take a bit longer, but travel is one of the great things about this profession, in my opinion, and going to mm -hmm. conferences and meeting people and sharing ideas and also finding running routes and trails and things like that in other cities is always nice too. For sure. For sure. It is definitely one of the best bits of the profession. Awesome. Well, this has been so great. Ali, thanks so much for taking the time to share about your research. And I'm looking forward to reading a lot more of your work as soon as I can. So thanks again so much for joining us here on The Annex. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to The Annex, a sociology podcast. I'm Dan Morrison from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Thanks to our guest, Ali Megji, to Joe Cohen, the director of the Queen's Podcast Lab, and to our editors, music by Lena Orsa. 